Apache Web Server. The Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, was created by Tim Berners-Lee and his team. They proposed the World Wide Web project in 1989. They had a first working version in 1991, and then the RFC that defined it, RFC 1945, was in 1996. However, by the time many web browsers were already out there and people were using the web. There are multiple RFCs, including 2616, which is for the HTTP 1.1 protocol. The HTTPS protocol, or the Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, layers the HTTP protocol on top of the SSL and then now TLS protocol. So SSL 3 is the same thing as TLS 1, so basically it's just kind of transferring over to the newer ones. So you want to make sure you have TLS, not SSL. It was created by Netscape Communications in 1994 for the Netscape browser. So the Netscape Navigator browser and used and everyone else were using it. It created an industry for signing digital certificates. So many companies were able to make money off of this, including the uh, Ubuntu project was funded by Mark Shuttleworth, who made his money off of this as well. HTTP security concerns. There are some, some concerns you should think about. Um, all communication over HTTP is plain text and easily sniffed or wiretapped. People can read it. They can also inject their own stuff into it. Some ISPs are starting to inject ads or JavaScript into your sessions and break things, and that's always nice. Gotta, gotta know who your ISPs are. Web servers and web browsers cannot prevent programmers from making mistakes or malicious users from exploiting these mistakes, so you have to keep that in mind. The HTTPS protocol also has some security concerns. There are various SSL and TLS protocols with different levels of security, so you need to keep that in mind if you get a browser that allows you to have keys of size zero, that's not so good. Um, you just need to make sure you know what your browser allows, and if you're running a server, know what your server is serving. Certificate authorities are sometimes exploited and used for further exploitation, so you need to be aware of that. And then government agencies such as the NSA have promoted protocols with secret vulnerabilities, such as random number generators that don't produce random numbers. Some useful packages include the HTTPD package, which provides the Apache web server. You have links, which is a text-based web browser for testing things if you are not running on a, on a GUI environment. Sometimes you want to test things from the server, and links is pretty good for that. Also, OpenSSL, which allows you to make certificates. You can also sign your own certificates. Um, you can get the um, certificate signing request. You can then use and send to a third party who will sign them for you. So OpenSSL will do that stuff for you. Mod SSL will allow you to integrate into Apache the HTTPS functionality and then serve secure web pages. The Apache web service can be started using systemctl. You can use systemctl start httpd. You can also stop, restart, check status, and also you have this reload option. Reload is interesting because what it does is it will send a signal to the server. The server is then prompted to reread its configuration files, and the server is actually multiple servers running, and when you send this over, the main service can reread the configuration files and respawn new children and then just let the other children well kill them off and then you won't have to worry about it anymore so you can keep your server running while you change configurations which is kind of nice there are 
some other issues. Whenever you want to connect to your web server from the outside, you need to get through the firewall. The firewall is not open by default for the HTTP and HTTPS services, so you need to open those up. You can do that with the firewall-cmd command. You just need to use the dash dash add service equals HTTP or HTTPS options. If you want it to be permanent, you can use the dash dash permanent option as well and that will make it so the firewall is open and well permanently open you can use the firewall dash cmd space dash dash list all command if you want to see which firewall rules are in place and which services are available so you can know if you will be able to get to the firewall the main apache configuration files are found in the slash etc slash httpd slash conf directory also you have this etc httpd conf.d directory which has these other configurations such as user directories and ssl configurations but the most common file you'll work with is the etc httpd conf httpd Dot com file. This httpd.com file is the main file and there is a directive in that file that loads all the other files in the conf.d directory. So in that directory you can, well in that file you can configure your Apache web server, tell it which ports are open, you can tell it whether or not um, it allows certain types of data or other types of pages such as server side clues and CGI. You can turn those things on or off. You can also change which directory index files are used when a directory is, or a file is not specified within a directory. So normally that's index.html, but you can have it be index.cgi, index.php, index.shtml, many different options. So you also have a directory setting in there where you can change where the uh, directory root is and you can also change your document root your default document root is your var www.html directory so you can go there and see your web pages or set your web pages when you are creating web pages there are a couple of se linux context types you should be aware of the following are some that are used by apache you have this httpd underscore sys underscore content underscore t which is used for regular system wide web pages when you're serving web pages for your web server you can also use cgi scripts and i like cgi scripts a lot and so i think it's very important for me to know the httpd sys script exec t type which you have to set on all of your cgi scripts as well as setting your execute permissions or execute bits if you are not in the normal system directories and you are in user land well user all this is user land but in user user home user directories and you've turned that on in your user dir configurations then you can use this httpd user content t or http user script exec t and keep those in mind in addition to those types, you also have types for directories, whether or not you're allowed to upload files or not upload files, and so just keep that in mind. Troubleshooting. So when you are having trouble with your Apache web server or web pages, it's good to first verify your IP address is correct. Sometimes it isn't correct. Sometimes you have DHCP, you want to make sure you have a static IP address, or if you're doing DHCP, that's fine too. But verify the services are running. You can use netstat and you can check to make sure they're there and listening. Verify the, the firewall is on the way. You can use the firewall dash cmd space dash dash list dash all command in order to verify the firewall is not blocking anything. Make sure it's open. You can use the se linux commands. You can use the ls minus al capital z in order to see the context types of files and make sure they are correct. Um, sometimes this is really important in a situation where you have SE Linux running, you have all your permissions set correctly, and you think a file should be available, but Apache just can't see it. So SE Linux. Also, that tends to throw up uh, SE Linux 
well errors in the uh, audit log so you can go to var log um, audit audit log I believe to look at the audit logs you can also verify to make sure the remote host is up and you can ping it you can use nmap to scan it make sure the ports are open you can also check the Apache um, logs so var log HTTPD and make sure the access log and error logs don't show anything or if they do show something use that to troubleshoot and you can also check system logs and see if you have trouble starting the Apache web server and that is the end for this presentation database servers MariahDB is a database based on an older MySQL database it was also created by the same people MariahDB is a drop-in replacement for MySQL. MariahDB is a relational database management system, so that's RDBMS, and implements the Structured Query Language, or SQL. So here's a little bit of the history. So MariahDB, well, it's kind of a fork. Um, first, MySQL was created and replaced Oracle in many projects, especially in open source. Oracle is not was not very happy with this and it wanted to do something to solve the problem so there was a time when MySQL was not financially able to continue on and so that became an issue so Oracle was trying to get rid of MySQL and it acquired multiple companies that provided libraries to MySQL and that was a bit of an issue Eventually, Sun Microsystems acquired MySQL, did the whole white knight thing, and saved it from Oracle Takeover. However, a little bit later, Oracle discovered that they could grab MySQL, Java, and other things all at once, and they bought Sun Microsystems. Eventually, the developers of MySQL decided to fork the MySQL code, and they formed MariahDB. The current versions of CentOS use MariahDB as the database. There are a couple of MariahDB security concerns. First of all, the default MariahDB installation does not have a root password. So you can create users, database, tables, all without setting up a password. Also, this might not be a, a major concern, security concern, but administrators can reset the root password for the databases and get full access if they want to. It might actually be a helpful thing if you lose access to your database and you can't get back into it. The root user can then help you get back into it. There are many useful packages. There is the MariahDB, um, that is the client programs the MariahDB server, which is the server, and then there is the mysql-python package, which provides a way for the Python language to communicate with the MySQL or MariahDB servers. Generally, the configurations for MariahDB are just fine and you can leave them alone. However, if you do want to go in there and make some kind of a change, you can go into the etc slash my.cnf.d directory and you can find configuration files in there you can mess with. The standard format of the configuration files is a name equals value pairs. For example, you can type in port equals 12345 and you can change which port it runs on. Here are a couple of a sample MariahDB commands. So from the command line, you can type in MySQL to get into MariahDB. You can also do options such as minus U and the username or minus H and the host name and minus P to prompt for a password. And this will get you into the MySQL or MariahDB databases depending on which one you actually have installed. So once you're inside, you can create databases. You just type in create database and then the name of the database you want to create. And then to actually use that database, you use the word use and the database name and it will change your prompt and indicate that you are now inside of that database. 
Once you're inside the database, you can create tables. So here's an example, create table people, which gives it two columns. You have name and age. Name is a primary key and it is a var char 250. And age is an integer. So with those tables, here are a couple of sample SQL statements. You can insert values into that people table. You can update the people table and replace information. You can do select statements to pull information out. And you can also delete records from the table. So these are the four basic commands. You have insert, update, select, and delete. There are other commands see but those are the main four. You can also do things like uh, insert into the table and then if there are duplicate keys you can just update instead which is very common for things like logs and so I do that quite a bit. So if you're using Python and you want to do programming here are a couple of pieces of well a bunch of code examples thrown together onto one page you want to import the MySQLDB library and you want to make sure that you pay close attention to case here because the case is important. You want to connect to it and then once you connect to the database you want to create a cursor. A cursor is where you send your commands so you just send your commands, you can execute the SQL statements and after you're executing the after you've executed the statements, you can sometimes grab back data. If you make changes, so inserts and deletes, sometimes you want to commit that, and that is committed not with the cursor, but with the actual connection. And then when you want to close, you can close the connection itself. If you're trying to troubleshoot MariahDB, you want to make sure your IP address is correct if you are going to a different machine, which is not usually the case, but you could. Um, you want to make sure the service is running. If it's not running, it's very difficult to connect to the database. You want to verify the firewall is not in the way if you are going over something. Normally, people just run it on their local machine and they use Apache to actually get out. So you're interfacing with a web server and the web server is talking directly to the database. And so the firewall is not an issue. You want to make sure that any SC Linux stuff is not changed. If it is changed, you go and verify things. You want to make sure if you're going to remote machine that the host is up and make sure that ports are open if they need to be. And if there are any problems and you can't figure it out, just take a look at the logs. Most of these things only matter if you are using a remote machine, which is very unlikely. Anyway, this is your MariahDB or database overview. Domain name system or DNS. The DNS protocol converts names to IP addresses and vice versa. It also does names, names, and other things as well. But it solves some of the problems of the host file because the host file was getting too big. There was at one point a single host file and people would send their submissions to the maintainer of this host file and the maintainer would update this host file and then people would download copies of this host file and it became a regular full-time job basically and so the DNS protocol was in was basically invented as a solution to this problem how do you maintain this giant host file so it became a hierarchical database of information. It was invented in 1983 and 84 and has been in wide use since the mid-1980s. The DNS protocol operates on both UDP and TCP ports 53. UDP for your normal inquiries and TCP for your downloads of zone transfers and things like that. There are a couple of DNS security issues or concerns you need to think about. If you send spoofed responses while making a request, the DNS server might get confused and keep your entries. Basically the way this happens is you send a request to your DNS server. Your DNS server, if it doesn't have a cache, will have to go to another server to get the information. So it sends the request. If you know where it's sending the request, 
and you can spoof that source address, you can send a reply as if it were coming back from the server that it requested from. And if you do it fast enough, your reply will get there before the actual reply from the server it's requesting it from, and then it will get loaded in the cache of your DNS server and cause it to have incorrect data. The next concern is that alternative DNS routes can't redirect all of your traffic. So it's a hierarchy, and it starts from the root servers, which delegate to servers that manage the top-level domains, and those delegate to individual servers that manage domain names and things like that. If you modify the DNS root, you can redirect all the traffic somewhere else. So some countries have done, done this, and such as uh, China did this for a little bit, might still be doing it. Other countries have done this where they have created their own root servers and redirect everything. In addition to redirecting traffic from the root servers, you can also do DNS manipulation by ISPs. Your ISP controls all of your traffic. They can manipulate, manipulate your traffic. So if you send a request out to a DNS server and your ISP decides to modify the DNS query or response, they can do that. Also, there is registrar-based DNS manipulation because the registrars are where the individual um, domain owners well have their data stored and those could redirect and point different places you can also uh, trick DNA, uh, registrars into transferring names over to you and it can be all kinds of a mess so on Linux we tend to use the bindd DNS server um, usually you'll hear about it being bindd uh, bind or named anyway there are a couple of things to think about um, all host names end in a trailing dot normally when you see a host name you don't put a trailing dot on it but the DNS server knows it has a trailing dot and it puts it there um, so you need to be aware of that because bind treats it like it should be there host names and IP addresses in DNS are written with the largest grouping on the right and the smallest on the left what does that mean? Well, if you look at a name like example.com, com is a much larger grouping, and so it's on the right-hand side. Example would be on the left-hand side because it's smaller. So the larger it is, the further to the right. But if you think about IP addresses, something like 10.11.12.13, and you say, well, which one's the largest grouping? Well, the 10 is the largest. So it's on the left hand side but that's not where the DNS wants to put it it wants to put it on the right hand side so if you were to write out your 10.11.12.13 in a DNS type format it would actually be 13.12.11.10 and then it would it'd have a uh, dot in adder dot arpa so keep that in mind also, some types of records have a single value and some have more than one value. MX records have a priority and a value. So an MX record will take a name, usually a domain name, and then it will give you a priority and it will also give you a host name of a machine you can talk to if you want to send your mail. In addition to that, there's things like the SOA records and other records that have multiple different pieces in them. Some of the useful packages in installing bind, well you have bind and you have bind-utils. Bind-utils is really good, it provides all those really important tools like nslookup and dig which are good for, well, doing DNS queries. You want those. When you are configuring your bind server or namedy, the main configuration file is in the etc directory, etc namedd.conf. So you go in there, you modify that file. Sometimes it's etc namedd, then namedd.conf, but you find the file there, you modify that file, and that file lists all of the data that you need to know about. So where is the data stored? Well, the data is normally stored in the var namedd directory. So you have the var namedd data, which would be all of the zones that you control. 
And then you have var named these slaves for all the zones that are acting as secondary or slave zones. And those would be zones you get from somebody else. Now there is a big push for renaming things. And so while it is var named these slaves right now, you'll probably find that words like master and slave will start to disappear because they have a negative connotation. So just be aware that the name might change to something like secondary or something else. What does the name d.conf file look like? Well, you have different zones in there. There's lots of data in it, but you have these little entries for your individual zones. So that top one right there is for the domain.ext. So you could have a example.com zone. And then inside of it, you have well, information about that zone. This one, because we own it and we control it, we have the type as master. And then you list the file. Where's the file? Where the file is going to be called domain.ext.zone. And where would you find that? Well, you're probably going to find it in the var name D, maybe data directory, but you have to look at the rest of the configuration file to figure out where things are actually stored. All right, if you look at the IP addresses, let's say we were doing something for the 10 dot range. We want to do the entire 10 dot range all in one file, which is quite a bit actually. So you might do zone 10 dot in dash adder dot arpa. That would be the zone that you'd be doing. And you'd have it be a master because you are controlling it and configuring it. And then the file type would be, or the file name would be something like your IP address dot zone. Now the file names don't have to match the the backwards orientation or anything like that. So you could just put 10.0.0.zone. It doesn't even need to add an end in the word zone, but some editors treat different files differently depending on the extension. So that's something to keep in mind. So you have forward zones and reverse zones. A forward zone is a zone that uses names as its lookup. A reverse zone is something that goes from IP addresses back to names. So forward zones have multiple different types of records in them. So here's an example forward zone with, well, a bunch of things, a bunch of variables and some of that. But we can see the very top line right there is a dollar sign then TTL 3H which basically means your time to live for each of your entries is three hours. That's the default time, but it can be overridden and changed. And then you can see the at sign. The at sign means for the entire zone. So at in ns dns.domain.ext dot. You see that trailing dot? That's important. So basically what this is is a record for this zone and this zone is defined as whatever's in the name d.com file. It's saying that the name server for this zone is dns.domain.ext. Well, you're gonna to need to make sure you have this dns.domain.ext defined somewhere. So we're assuming this is the domain.ext file, and you can see at the very bottom line there is a DNS in A, and then you put the IP address there. And the IP address right there is written in normal IP address format, so it'd be 10.11.12.13. No trailing dot in that one. So what you have is the word DNS in the front of that line, and then your IP address at the end. And if there is nothing after the DNS, no trailing dot, it assumes that you are just giving an address in that, that domain. And so if this is domain.ext, it will assume that is dns.domain.ext dot. And that would satisfy the name server record at the top with an A record at the bottom. Inside of each domain, you have a start of authority type um, record in SOA. Uh, and each one of these records has a couple different pieces. You can see the domain that it's doing everything for is the domain.ext and then you have this root.domain.ext. Well, what is that? That's actually an email address. You don't see the at sign in the middle of the email address because the first dot is supposed to be replaced with an at sign when you write the email address. So it actually be root at domain.ext dot 
as the email address for the administrator of that record. And then you can see the serial number. The serial number is usually written in a, a four digit year, a two digit month, two digit day, and then a serial number. So every time you make an edit to the information, you'd want the date written there. And then you start with 00010203, you just count up. This would only allow up to uh, 100 edits that day. And the serial number is used when you do zone transfers in order to figure out if the zone is already, well, if it's new or if it's the same zone. So if the serial number is the same, it will assume there are no changes and will not download the zone. So when you have your secondary servers out there, they need to make sure that the root server has serial numbers changing. The other numbers are refresh, retry, expire, default, time to live, those kinds of things. And those are all written in a number of seconds. So you can kind of get an idea of how long each one of these is. Some of the different types of records include your A records, your quad A or AAAA, you have your MX records, you have your CNAME records, your TXC records, there's all kinds of records. So you can see a couple of different examples here. The A records are for um, for taking a name and converting it to an IP version 4 address. Your quad A records take a name and convert it to an IPv6 address. Your MX record is a record that takes a name and converts it into a priority and a name and that is for your mail exchange. So if this were for the um, domain.ext or example.com, if you wanted to send an email to um, that domain, you need to figure out where your mail server is. And so that MX record right there indicates that you would go to the mail in the domain server. So maybe mail.domain.ext and you can see the record right above it is an A record that tells you the IP address of that. Then you have a couple of C name records. C names are aliases. And C name stands for canonical name. So you can see that POP and IMAP both map to mail. And you can see mail maps to an IP address. And then you can see under the mail, in addition to having an A record, mail also has a TXT record. And the TXT record has what is called an SPF, and this is used to indicate which machines are allowed to send mail for that domain. So if you received mail for something, and this would probably actually be in the app, but if you receive mail for a given domain, you'd want to know who is authorized to send mail. So you can do a lookup using the SPF information in a TXC record and figure out which IP addresses are allowed to send mail, and this indicates that the 10 dot entire 10 dot network is allowed to send mail, but nothing else. So all other ones are not allowed. You also have reverse zones. So the top part of the reverse zone looks the same. You can see it jumps down to this origin thing, so origin to specify individual pieces. This is doing the 192.168.0 range. And you can see the 192.168.0.0 is that second to the bottom line where it is in zero in PTR for pointer network.domain.ext dot. So it's telling you what the name of that well IP address is when you do a reverse lookup. And you can see the dot one as well. The name D service needs to be started in order to start listening. You can use the systemctl command to start this, the name D server. You just type in systemctl start name D dot service. You can leave the dot service off if you want. Other options you have is the start, stop, restart, status. And then if you want to make sure it starts at boot time, you can use enable. And then if you want to remove that, you can use the disable to remove that so it won't start at boot time. In order to make DNS available, to really make it available, the DNS server needs to be able to receive data through the firewall. You need both UDP and TCP 53. 53 is only necessary if you're doing zone transfers, but normally DNS servers should be able to do zone transfers. 
so you want to indicate who can do zone transfers. So you can add the services or the service um, for the server with the command firewall dash cmd space dash dash add dash service equals DNS and that will add in the service so that DNS can get through the firewall. If you want it to be permanent you can do that same exact command with the dash dash permanent option and then it will put it into the configuration file so the next time the, the firewall starts up it will add that rule in there. You can verify whether the services are present in the firewall currently with the firewall dash cmd space dash dash list dash all command and that will indicate whether or not it is in the firewall. When you're troubleshooting make sure the DNS server is set and you can go look at the etc resolve.conf file and you'll see which DNS server you have set which is kind of important. You can make sure you want to make sure you can talk to your DNS server in normal ways. You can use NS lookup, you can use ping, all kinds of things to make sure you can talk to it. Make sure the record is download okay. You can use NS lookup or dig. You can do uh, a DNS hierarchy trace. So if you do a dig minus uh, plus trace command on something, it will start from the root servers and work its way down. You can figure out if you are in the DNS hierarchy. If you're not, then it's not likely anybody else will use you. You can make sure your firewall is correct. You can make sure logs look good. If you have any MX records or CNAME records, you want to make sure they point eventually to a valid A or quad A record. So CNAMES can point to other CNAMES and MXs can point to CNAMES, or they can both point to A or quad A records. But eventually, if you keep resolving it, it should get to a quad A record. You want to verify the service is running. So you can use netstat, make sure it's running. And you want to make sure that any SE Linux contexts are not strange. So you can go look in the var named directory and see if anything looks like it doesn't have named in it. It might not work properly. And that is it for DNS. So good luck. Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP. So the DHCP protocol operates on UDP ports 68 and 67. DHCP is based on a series of messages. You have a discovery message, an offer, request, and acknowledgments. So what happens is a client will come online and they will send out a DHCP discover packet. Then a DHCP server, assuming it sees it, will then offer a DHCP offer and they offer an IP address that the client could then potentially use. It is then up to the client to collect all the offers it receives, decide usually the, which, the first one that comes, but which one they're going to accept, and then they're going to request that of that DHCP server specifically. After it has been requested, they will, I mean, the request will be sent out broadcast so that all the other DHCP servers who made offers will see the request and then the acknowledgement comes back letting the client know that the request has been acknowledged and they can then start using that address. In addition to that they will get a, a lease so they'll get a certain amount of time they can use this address at the end of which they will have to renew well actually somewhere in the middle they'll renew their lease but at the end of which they would lose the address. So some security issues with DHCP. If you have rogue DHCP servers, they can give out addresses and that can be a problem. It could mean security issues. It could mean um, someone's giving you something incorrect. Sometimes you'll have someone plug a wireless access point, some kind of a uh, home router into your network backwards and it'll start issuing out addresses. You can block that on the, the switch, but you know, if it's not blocked, they can cause all kinds of havoc. Um, clients can spoof MAC addresses to gain additional access. So if you want to get access and you know that a specific IP address gets it or a certain MAC address gets it through the firewall, you can spoof addresses. And this isn't really a DHCP problem so much as an issue with MAC addresses and security and everything there but you can spoof things and get more access. Um, clients can also obtain multiple IP addresses by presenting multiple MAC addresses. So if you have a client that is trying to create a denial of service type situation, they could present 
a whole bunch of different MAC addresses, get a whole bunch of different IP addresses, and then lock them all up so they're not available to anybody else. Some of the useful packages. The most useful package here is the DHCP package, which includes the DHCP server, which is DHCPD. There are other ones that are there. You have a DHCP libs and DHCP common, which are used basically in order to get DHCP and the client to run. So the directories that are interesting, there is the etc DHCP directory, which contains all of your DHCPD configuration files. You can look in there and see what's there. You have your network configuration, and those are in the etc sysconfig network scripts directory. All of them start with the ifcfg, and then it's usually dash eth0 or ens32 or something else. So you have to go look and see what, what interfaces you have, um, and then you can go configure those. If you're running as a DHCP server, you can see the var lib DHCPD, DHCPD leases file, which will contain all of the leases you've given out. You might note that there are multiple copies of the same lease that's there, because sometimes a client will request something more than once. It might go down, come back up again before the lease is expired, and it might get a new renewed lease. Anyway, that leases file keeps track of all your leases for you. And then there is the var log messages file, which contains all kinds of information, such as all of your your discoveries and offers and all those things can show up in your var log messages file. So the configurations for the DHCP server, DHCP server are in the etc DHCP directory. The following is example DHCPD.conf file. You can see right there in the top, you have a the option domain name, you tell it your domain name, option domain name servers, you tell it what DNS servers people are using to get out, you tell it a default lease time, this one has 300, which is 300 seconds, a maximum lease time, which right here is 1200 seconds, so these are very short term leases, so a, a default lease of 5 minutes with a maximum lease of 20 minutes. Obviously you want to have much, much longer times, um, but they're in seconds. The subnet right there you can see we have a subnet being configured to give out information so this is the 10.10.00 slash 16 subnet and we are handing out addresses in that subnet only to 10.10.0.100 through 10.10.0.150 so there's only you know uh, 51 addresses that are being handed out and then we're telling them that their default gateway is 10.10.0.1. So that is your, the routers is your default gateway. You can also, in addition to just giving out a range of addresses, you can give out static addresses. So the DHCP server can be configured to assign the same IP address to a machine using the MAC address. This is very common in situations where you have a machine that has to come up with the same address every time because it provides services of some sort. The following example to assign a printer. So the printer had the MAC address of 00 colon 11 colon 22 colon 33 colon 44 colon 55. And then you could have it have a fixed address of 10.10.10.10, and that would be the information you give out. And so you put that inside of that subnet section on the previous slide to make sure it gets that information and also to make sure it still gets the router information and DNS information. The DHCP service needs to be started in order to start listening. You can use the systemctl command to start the DHCP server. So you use systemctl start dhcpd.service to start it up. And other options you have is stop, restart, status. Um, if you wanted to start at boot time, you can do enable, and then you can do disable to make it not start at boot time. Having the service running won't guarantee you can get anything you still need to make sure you can get through the firewall. And in order to receive a request, you need to make sure that the ports are open. So you really need to be doing both because it does it sends out and receives on different port numbers. But you can use the firewall-cmd-add-service equals DHCP command to add the DHCP service to your firewall. If you want to be permanent, once again, you need to make sure you add the dash dash permanent to the end. So firewall dash cmd space dash dash add dash service 
equals DHP space dash dash permanent to make it permanent and make it there when you start up. You can verify the services are present in the firewall as well with the firewall dash cmd space dash dash list dash all command and that will get it there. Once you have your server running, you can go check your messages and stuff like that. And, but if you're having problems and clients aren't getting things, you can go troubleshoot the clients first. If they, it's a physical connection, you want to make sure that you have the clients there. Um, you make sure the clients have NICs and cables. And um, you can use the LSPCI command on Linux to verify to make sure you have a NIC a driver. That could be important. You can verify the server address is static, so your DHCP server must have a static address, otherwise it will not work properly. It doesn't work off a of DHCP, so don't try. And you want to verify the firewall allows connections, so you can look at that. Verify or look at the logs to see if there's anything in there. Check the leases to see if it really is giving out leases or, you know, if they're being handed out. Um, if you are setting up a network you can actually have your configuration have multiple different um, subnet sections and then if you have multiple subnet sections you might be servicing different subnets based on information being forwarded so you want to verify the routers for the request if they need to do that you want to verify the spanning tree is not a problem sometimes spanning tree is configured so that a machine booting up will be assumed to be a switch in which case it will block everything until it is determined that the machine is not a switch and then will allow communication through so you want to make sure the span tree is not blocking anything and you want to make sure that the switches are allowing you to answer so your machine needs to be connected to an interface that is allowed to send out your your DHCP offers so you can receive the discoveries but you can't make an offer unless well you can't make an offer but your offer won't get out unless the interface is allowing you to get out. And so you want to make sure that the switches are not blocking you from making offers. And that is the end of this section. So good luck. Linux installation. So we're going to talk about CentOS. CentOS is based on the source code of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, RHEL. The CentOS distribution is community based and it does get some support from Red Hat in the form of paid developers. Red Hat pays for Red Hat developers, they also pay for Fedora developers, and they also pay for CentOS, some of the CentOS developers. So where does it fit in in the distribution families? There are a couple of different major sources of, well, Linux distributions. You've got the source code based Linux distributions that would include things like Slackware, which is one of the oldest. You have Gentoo and Arch, and even Android's kind of a, a source code based Linux distribution. Then you have the whole Red Hat family. Red Hat family includes Fedora, which is kind of their development suite. You have CentOS, which is a version of Red Hat with a lot of the proprietary stuff and branding removed. There is Oracle which is basically the same thing as CentOS, except it's uh, paid for by the Oracle company there. Red Flag, which is the uh, Linux distribution put out by China. And then there's also things like OpenSUSE. So these are all in the Red Hat family. So they all have a, they all have a lot of similarities. They all have the same Red Hat package management system. So you can identify them that way. Then there is the Debian family. The Debian family would include the, well, Debian. But you also have Ubuntu and Mint. Um, basically, you have Debian, and some people thought, well, it's kind of complex, so let's make it a little better. And so then you have Ubuntu, which is based on that. Then they decided, well, that's a little bit too complex, so they added a little bit more. They gave some more proprietary drivers, and you got Mint. And then you have other distributions such as Kali, which is your penetration testing distribution, which also is based off of the Debian family, probably based off of Ubuntu most directly. All right, when you're doing an installation, the first thing that you come across is you have the Anaconda installer. So Anaconda is just the name of the installer. 
But Red Hat based Linux distributions such as CentOS, Linux use Anaconda as the installer. So you'll find that a lot of these distributions have an installation wizard that looks the same. That's Anaconda. Anaconda is an installer written in Python. It's got some C parts as well. But it is responsible for making sure the operating system is correctly applied to the machine put in place. You have the bootloaders and everything else in place and it boots up. Anaconda works great some of the time. Sometimes it fails. It fails, well, a lot more than the actual Linux distribution will fail when it's running. So you got to be careful with that. Sometimes you have to start over, but that's usually okay. When you're in Anaconda, you have to configure networking. You need to make sure you configure a host name for the machine. Every machine should have its own host name. Don't stay with local host. Make sure you have a host name. You want to make sure the machine has either DHCP or static manual addresses configured. You can go in there and configure it up. Make sure you have a set. If you do DHCP, you have to make sure that you have a DHCP server in the network it's going to be residing in. If it is not doing DHCP, then you need to make sure you configure all the important parts of static or manual address configuration. You need an IP address, you need a mask, you need to have a gateway, and you need to have a DNS server. Also, after you configure the networking, you want to make sure you activate the interface so that it will come up when you start. You want to make sure you configure the date and time. Well, it's not really date and time you configure, it's more setting the time zone. That's kind of the important thing. You want to make sure the time zone is set, and it's best to set your time zone after you've already configured networking, so it'll automatically decide that you have networking and it will use network time. Network time provides the NTP protocol, or the network time protocol, to allow it to synchronize with time servers and get updates automatically. Normally it saves the time on your machine as UTC time, basically the Greenwich Mean Time or Zulu time. Windows, on the other hand, stores as local time, so what's written to the hardware might be different for Windows and Linux, and that can cause problems sometimes if you have a dual boot machine or a machine that uses both operating systems. Software selection. You want to make sure you select which software needs to be installed. So when you are starting, the easiest thing to do is to select the GNOME desktop. GNOME desktop will give you all the essentials and get you a GUI so you can have this clicking ability and the ability to do well easier things. However, Linux was designed mostly to be run without a GUI. Um, GUI has been built afterwards and they're they're nice and they can be very pretty, but you don't really want a GUI if you're running a server. So in a production environment you want to start with a minimal install and just add the features you need and not have everything else because there are security issues if you have too much. Any software you miss during the installation can be added after as long as it's not something like network drivers because you need the network. Installation destination. So Anaconda can automatically create partitions for you or you can create them manually yourself. So there are two main kinds of partitions you'll see. You can see the standard partitions you can create. Those are your normal fixed length partitions with older style device names. Things like slash dev slash SDA1, which you don't need to worry about. Or you can use the LVM partitions. LVM partitions basically creates this giant, well, Linux volume management partition and that partition is kind of a standard partition and then within that you create these blocks that you can then use and that's that allows you to be more flexible resizing and adding things and allowing you to span multiple drives much easier when you are configuring your partitions there are lots of different directories you can consider to have as separate partitions. Normally you want to have a root partition, which is the slash. You want to have your partition for virtual memory, which is your swap. And you also want to have a partition for the bootloader, the slash boot. 
that also includes things like the kernel and initial RAM disk. So those three are your general three you have. Sometimes you add more. The var directory contains logs and sometimes you can have problems if your logs fill up and it takes down your entire server. So some people put it as a separate partition to prevent that from happening. When you are done and you start the installation process, you are then given the option to create users. The main user for the system is called root. So root needs to have a password, needs to be nice and secure. The root user has all power as far as the users go on the system and can do many, many damaging, destructive things. You can also have additional users and additional users are very good to run on the system because they don't have all power, which means that if they make mistakes, they don't necessarily cause as much problems. These users could also be administrative users. So what happens is if you click the checkbox to make it an administrative user, it will add the user to the wheel group. So there are groups, and the wheel group allows members to run commands as root using the sudo command. So you type the sudo, space the name of the command, it will then usually prompt you for the user's password, and then after that they can run the commands as root. When you are done with the installation, sometimes you see a license agreement portion. If you're doing minimal install, you don't necessarily see it, sometimes you do, but you need to be aware that Linux comes with a license like any other operating system, it comes with a license. And most of the stuff, most of the packages you get on Linux are distributed under a free software or open source license. Free software licenses require all derivative works be distributed with a similar license. So if you have access to modify it, then this derivative license means that anybody else, when you redistribute it, has the same rights you received. So you have to provide those same rights. Open source licenses allow you to see and modify the code, and that's basically what they do. Now, free software licenses are a special type of open source license, slightly more restrictive, but it makes for more security of the source code in the long run. Once you have your system up and going, you should probably update it. Most Linux installation disks are not absolutely new, and there are updates that, well, need to be applied. So the first thing you should consider doing is updating your updating system, updating software. So you can type in yum update yum. Yum is your updater, so you want to update yum first. Now after that, something you need to keep in mind is that there might be updates that include, well, packages with libraries, that are part of your GUI. And you do not want to update your GUI from within, from within your GUI, so you wanna make sure you get out of it. You can press the Control-Alt-F2 key sequence to drop into a terminal back place where you can type in commands and not be inside of the GUI. You can also press Control-Alt-F1 to switch back into the GUI. On older versions of Linux or other versions of Linux, Sometimes it's control F6 or control F7 to get into your GUI. Just make sure you try a few, you'll figure it out. Once you are outside of your GUI, you want to update your system. So I recommend you don't even log into your GUI until your system is fully updated. But just type in yum update and that will update your system. And that is it for this lecture. Mail servers, most specifically Postfix. So the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, or SMTP, was published as RFC 788 in late 1981 by John Postal, who was considered the god of the internet. John Postal produced many, many different standards. Uh, lots of different RFCs have his name on them, especially the early ones. Um, he disappeared toward the end um, because he died, but um, he was one of the founding inspirational members of the creation of the internet. So this SMTP protocol uses plain text commands to communicate with remote servers listening on TCP port 25. 
You also have webmail and application client programs that send mail. And what happens with those is you have this, this front end, but you still have a mail server in the back end. So this is a local mail server that handles all the communication with the remote servers. It sends and receives them. And then you use the webmail or application clients to retrieve it from the server and send it to the server. There are many different directories involved with these mail servers. The etc postfix directory contains all the configuration, configuration information for the postfix server. You have the var spool mail directory and that one contains all the email that has been received and processed and put into users files. So there's, there's an mbox style file basically just lists all the email messages one after another in one long text file. So you can go there and grab the mail messages for each of the users. And then there is these var spool postfix directory and that's where postfix stores data it's using as it's acting as a server, all the incoming mail, outgoing mail, it stores in different folders. There are lots of things in the protocol, um, such as the ability to retry sending mail when the server's down and other things like that. So it has to maintain and hold things that are still on their outbound direction. Also inbound is this processing and looking at things. The var log mail log uh, file is a log that can be used to troubleshoot email related problems. All kinds of things show up in there about the mail server and mail messages coming in and out. There are some SMTP security concerns. First of all, plain text messages can be viewed in transit. So if you are sending or receiving mail, anybody along the way between the source and the destination could look at the mail and read it. Now that doesn't mean you can't encrypt your message inside of your mail, but the header data would still be unencrypted. So if you keep that in mind, all of the messages are plain text. If the message itself is encrypted, that doesn't mean the headers are encrypted. Anyone can send unsolicited messages at a very low cost. So spam is very cheap. You can send all kinds of mail. Um, you can claim to be anybody you want. There are a lot of different changes in how mail servers are handling this. And so they can look at things and say, well, you're claiming to be from one server, but you're actually sending it from a different server, and then they can mark you as spam. And there are other things they can do to try to filter things out. Also, the protocol allows for things like relays, which make it easier to spoof sources so you can send mail messages through a server. Most mail servers now are configured by default to not allow relaying, but relaying is still possible and it can still be turned on. The messages themselves can carry malicious files or content. You got things all the way way back to the I Love You virus that was hitting people's machines and then being processed locally and causing all kinds of problems to more malicious, more recent malicious things. Um, you can have all kinds of tricky messages. You can have messages um, telling you about a Nigerian prince or selling you things, um, claiming to be somebody they're not. And yeah, those are bad. And rejected messages can be used to perform directory harvesting attacks. You can just send email messages to everybody in your system and then decide which messages get bounced and which ones don't, and the ones that get bounced probably mean there's nobody there. The ones that don't get bounced, well, they probably mean there's somebody, somebody is there. So you can use that to find who's on the system and then use that information to then try to log into their account by guessing passwords and things like that. So some of the useful packages, um, Postfix is the SMTP mail server. You have other things that are related. Uh, Dovecot, which we will not talk about much, um, does provide your POP and IMAP servers. So Dovecot's a nice thing to look at. Telnet. Telnet is a great terminal emulation program that allows you to connect to ports and you can use it to Telnet to your local host, port 25, if you want to walk through the mail protocol and try to figure out what's going wrong. Alpine 
is a great email client. Um, it comes from, well, it's based off of uh, Pine, which was based off of Pico, and Nano is based off of Pico. So you get this kind of um, thing happening here. Anyway, Alpine is a great text-based uh, email client, and you can use it, but you have to first install the ePEL libraries. So if you don't have the ePEL-release package, you'll need to get that in there, and then get Alpine. Postfix is available and running on default CentOS Linux 7 machines, but it is only listening locally. So it's receiving local host type email messages, and some of the services use mail as a way to communicate with the administrator. So uh, one example would be the cron process. Whenever there's a cron job that produces output, it will send an email message to the user, user root, indicating what the output of the command was. So normally you write cron jobs that have no output unless there's an error, and then they produce output and it gets emailed to the administrator. But if you wanted to do more than just listen locally, you need to make some configuration changes. So in order to configure Postfix to allow external con connections, you need to edit the etc postfix main.cf file and allow listening on all interfaces. So you can scroll down a little ways through that file until you find a section with four lines. The top line would be the inet interfaces equals all, which will be commented out. You need to uncomment that one. And you want to take the one that says inet interfaces equals local, and you want to comment that one. Now, when you uncomment it, make sure you just remove the hash mark. Don't remove it, leave a space there or something like that, because then it won't work. So make sure you do it correctly. And then, once again, you have to restart your service. So if you want to restart your service, you can use the systemctl command. So systemctl start postfix.service. You can do systemctl with a start, stop, restart, status to start, stop, and restart or get the status of your service. You can also make sure it starts on boot time with the enable or make it not start on boot time with disable. Now you don't need to worry about enable and disable because it should be running already by default once again because it comes pre-configured that way. In order to receive mail, the mail server must be obviously listening, but it also needs to be allowed to receive communications to TCP port 25 from outside machines. So in order to allow inbound TCP 25, you can use the following command. Just use the firewall dash CMD space dash dash add dash service equals SMTP, which will allow the SMTP protocol to come through. Well, allow port 25 to come through. You can then verify the services are present in the firewall as well with the firewall dash CMD dash dash list dash all command. And once again, if you want to allow your service to be there after a restart of your firewall, you'd want to add the dash dash permanent option to the top command so that it, it gets stored into the firewall configuration files. So when it boots up, it will automatically add it there. One more thing to think about, um, external email service identification. So Postfix and other email servers follow standard protocols, which is nice, but it's also kind of confusing sometimes. In order to send email, the Postfix server uses the host domain part of the email address to identify the server. So if it's a bob at example.com, it's going to check first for a DNS record for the, well, an MX record for example.com. If it does not find it, it will check for an A record in the DNS service. And so it looks for example.com, and if it finds an MX record, it will use that. If it doesn't, it will use the A record. And if it doesn't find that, it will not send the mail. So it does not use the ETC host file. So don't try to make that work. It just doesn't work. It refuses to do that. So you want to make sure you can use your DNS service, which means you have to have it configured. Troubleshooting. So if you are having trouble sending mail or receiving mail, you want to verify your IP address is correct. 
you want to verify the services are running, you have your mails are running and up and going, you want to verify the firewall is not in the way, you want to verify the DNS records are there so that it knows which server to uh, identify and use. You want to make sure the remote host is up and you can ping it to do that. You also want to verify that the remote ports are open so you can use Nmap to scan the machine make sure port 25 is open. Um, you want to make sure you can check logs. So you can go in that var log mail log and take a look at that. You can also check the mail directory and see if mail is being received. So here are a couple of things and that is our mail server or postfix mail server overview. Network file system or NFS. The NFS protocol was developed by Sun Microsystems, which is now Oracle, in 1984. It was built on the Open Network Computing Remote Procedure Call, ONC RPC. It has some open standards. These are RFCs 1094, 1813, 3010, 3530, 5661. So you can look those up and look at the protocol and find information. NFS was originally just a Sun Microsystems thing, and then it went to other Unix distributions, made it to things like Linux and Mac OS X, and eventually to Windows. So it's available all over the place, and it's pretty good. So in order to get NFS running, you need a couple of useful utilities. Uh, NFS-utils is a package you can install which provides NFS. You also probably want to have man pages. This is in general for everything. You want to have man pages for, well, reading the man documentation. The NFS service needs to be started after the remote procedure call service is running. If you don't have it running, bad things happen. So on a CentOS 7 machine, you want to do a system CTL start RPC bind and start that service. You also want to make sure that if you want it to start automatically at boot time, you do a system CTL enable RPC bind and make sure it's there as well. NFS should only be started after RPC. Once you have RPC running, you can do a system CTL start NFS server and get the server up and going. You can also enable that one as well to make sure it's running at boot time. Now the NFS server needs to have a list of directories it's exporting. These directories are listed in the ETC export file. So the basic format is you type in your share name, that's the directory location that you want to be exporting. And then you want to decide, well, you list who you are exporting it to. If you want to list export to everybody, you just put a star there. And then inside the permissions, you list, well, information about what permissions you're exporting it as. So if it's read only, you do RO. If it's read write, you do RW. If you want to do something else, you can put other permissions in there as well for the exporting. So. Once that's there, you can use the export FS command to actually export the directories. Usually you type in export FS space dash A to export all of your shares that are being shared in that ETC exports file. You can type in the export FS command by itself to then get a listing of which directories are being exported. NFS doesn't really work well if you cannot get through the firewall. So you need to make sure you allow it to get through the firewall. So you go in there and you use the firewall CMD, firewall dash CMD command, and you give the options. You can give it the dash dash zone equals public. That's actually optional, you can, it's just default. Um, but you wanna do an add dash service equals RPC bind just like it's displayed here. So it's dash dash add dash service equals RPC dash bind. That will allow the RPC bind to get through. You also want to add the NFS service through. Now, these are both great if you 
then restart your firewall, they will no longer be there. So you want to make sure you use the dash dash permanent option if you want them to be written to the firewall configuration file and be there after the firewall is rebooted. All right, you can then verify they're there. You can use the firewall dash CMD command dash dash list dash services to see which services um, are there. You can also use the firewall dash CMD space dash dash list dash all command to list all of your firewall rules. I like the bottom one better because it gives me more of a, well, big picture of what's actually going on. Okay. Once again, um, to make services available at boot time, you need to make sure the system has a proper symbolic link for you to run, run it. So each run level has a set of symbolic links. In CentOS 7, they have simplified it in earlier versions with the init before you had the systemd. You had uh, these, well, seven run levels, zero through six zero being halt, six being reboot, and one being just your basic system, three being your multi-user system, five being your GUI, and they decided to simplify this down to just a couple. So you got your, your multi-user one and your GUI one. And what happens is when you use the systemctl command with enable, it will create a symbolic link from that run levels directory over to the actual script that starts. So you just do a system CTL enable and enable your services, the RPC bind and your NFS server. When you want to mount NFS shares, and I would recommend mounting NFS shares as a test before you put it in anything like your file system table FS tab. Um, you want to make sure you can mount them manually. So after the remote server has the shares exported and the NFS server is running and the firewall is out of the way, you can mount the shares. So you just type in mount the remote server's name or IP address, colon the share or the directory being exported, and then the mount point you want to mount it at. So the directory name of the location you want to mount it to. So if I had, let's say, a friend who was exporting his music files and I wanted to see the music files, uh, assuming this is all legal music files, of course, he might be exporting it from myfriend.com, for example.com, and it might be the slash music directory, and I might want to mount it into my local music directory so I might type in mount space uh, example.com colon slash music space slash local music and then it would mount up and hopefully everything will work perfectly and smoothly all right so in addition to just being able to manually mount things sometimes you want to have it automatically mount on boot time this is especially important for situations where you have a machine that is getting its home directory from a server so you can have the server exporting the slash home directory it might be mounting the home directory from the server and you want to then go into the etc fs tab file and well make sure it's mounting and there is a standard format for all of the mounted partitions you want to give it the device name the mount point the type your options the dump number and the file system check number the device is the server and the colon and the share so if you are going from example.com slash home then the mount point then be where it's mounted to so maybe be something like slash home the type would be nfs and then you have your options any options for mounting whether or not you want to allow it to mount smoothly or if you wanted to make sure it's got this hard hard mounting whether or not you want it to crash when it goes down um, usually just defaults and dump and file system check usually just leave zeros Anyway, you can read all about using the FS tab file and the 
formatting in the man pages, which you should have because you have installed the man package. When you're troubleshooting, you want to verify that your IP address is correct. So go take a look at the IP address, make sure it's correct, make sure the IP address you are of the server is correct, make sure you are in the same network, things like that. Verify that the service is running. You want to make sure your service is, well, the server is exporting everything that's running. You can use netstat, you can use exportfs to make sure it's exporting. Verify the firewall is on the way. You can use the firewall-cmd space dash dash list dash all command to see what's actually being allowed through the firewall. You want to make sure that the remote server is up and you can ping things. Um, you can use tools like nmap. You can install nmap and use that also to verify ports are available when you're scanning the remote server. So good luck with your NFS installation. Samba. The server message block SMB protocol was originally designed at IBM for use in DOS operating systems. Microsoft started working with it in 1990 and has incorporated it in Windows since Windows 3.1, which was Windows for workgroups. The Samba package implements SMB and uses it for communication with Windows devices. The SMB protocol has many security concerns. The SMB protocol has received many security updates since Windows Vista. However, it is known to be a security risk because of older, older implementations and even some newer bugs. We can use SMB to hack into Windows XP and Windows Server 2003 machines. With Windows XP, all you had to do was have file sharing ports open through the firewall or just have your firewall turned off, which was very common for gaming back in the Windows XP days. Windows Server 2003 came right out of the box, open for attacks and complete takeover through the SMB protocol. Many major companies, including Sony, have been hacked through the SMB protocol. There are a lot of useful packages in Samba. In the Samba set, there is the Samba package, which installs Samba and dependencies. You have the Samba client, which provides the SMB client, which allows you to navigate through a remote Samba share and download and upload files. You have SIFS utils, which allows you to mount Samba shares, and you can even set it up so they mount automatically in your FS tab file. The Samba service can be started using the systemctl command. Just use systemctl start smb and it will start the Samba server. You can also stop, restart, and check status. If you wanted to start at boot time, you just use the systemctl enable smb.service to enable it. In order to allow other machines outside of your individual server to mount your Samba shares, you need to open up a hole in the firewall. So the easiest way to do that is to add the Samba service. So you can use the firewall-cmd command, you can add the zone if you want, then dash dash add dash service equals Samba. You can verify the services present in the firewall using multiple commands, my favorite being the bottom right there, which was or is firewall-cmd space dash dash list dash all which will list all of the services that are available through the firewall. When you want to configure Samba, the main configuration files are found in the etc Samba directory. The most important of those configura configuration files is the smb.conf. You might be able to find a file like smb.conf.example and you might want to copy that over the smb.conf file before you start editing and then you can go in and set all kinds of configuration settings because they'll be available and easy to see. Here is an example of an excerpt of, well, part of the smb.com file. We have a share called software which is being exported. That share is based on the slash share slash software directory. So whatever files in that slash share share slash software directory are being exported. When that directory shows up on a remote machine, it will be called Windows Software Packages. 
it is public so you can see it it is writable so it's read write but it is not printable so it's not a printer so that's the information you see right there when you want to share your Samba shares you might have issues with SE Linux and their context. SE Linux is very good for protecting you from very bad mistakes you might make but files shared using Samba should have the correct SE Linux context type of a Samba underscore share underscore T in order to be able to be viewable by the Samba service. To change the context of the file you can use the chcon command which is change context so chcon minus T for the type Samba underscore share underscore T and then your file name or director name and it will change the context type so that the Samba service can see the file. If you're having trouble with Samba it's good to verify the IP addresses are correct. You want to verify the services are running. You can use netstat to view that. You can verify the firewall is not in the way using the firewall dash cmd space dash dash list dash all command to see which services are allowed through the firewall. You can verify the SE Linux context is set correctly. You can use this ls minus capital Z or ls minus al capital Z and that will tell you the context type of all the files in the directory or you can just do ls minus capital Z of the file to list its context type. If it's a directory you want to add a D in there so there's all kinds of things. You can verify the remote host is up using ping. You can verify remote ports are open using nmap from a remote machine. And you can also check the logs to see what's happening. And that is your overview for Samba. Secure Shell. The Secure Shell or SSH protocol was created in 1995 to prevent sniffing of Telnet and R login traffic at Helsinki University of Technology. SSH is encrypted and Telnet and R login were both not encrypted and still aren't encrypted. So the SSH protocol uses the Diffie-Hellman key exchange for key generation that it then uses to symmetrically encrypt data. Many programs use SSH to create tunnels and transfer data securely. The SSH package is normally, or the packages are normally installed on a CentOS or other Linux system by default. However, if you want to install them or take a look at them, they are the OpenSSH server package, which provides the server, OpenSSH, which provides some of the tools, the OpenSSH clients, which provides web clients, and then another useful package, which is not actually SSH, but is closely tied to it, is rsync. Rsync allows you to synchronize data on two ends, so a client and server can synchronize data over SSH. I can do it itself without SSH as well. When you're configuring SSH, there are a couple of configuration files. The main SSH configuration files are in the following two files. You have the etc ssh sshd underscore config, and the same thing without the D. The one with the D is for the server, and the regular one, the ssh underscore config, is for the client. Individuals can also have additional override type information for their clients in their .ssh directory, their home directory. So some common configuration changes you would see on the server end is disabling root logins which is very important in situations where you're constantly being attacked by people trying to log in your system. If you don't want them to have the option of doing a brute force login, you can just disable root logins and then they have to log in as a different user and then switch over somehow using sudo or su. Um, you could change the port number. Sometimes people change it from 22 to something else and then they log in with that number. You can disable password authentication which means you have to use keys to get in, which makes it more secure. This is very common. Um, Amazon Web Services does this by default. It makes it more secure and less likely to be hacked because, once again, you can't do the brute force logins. And you can also do changes to things like X11. X11 is your GUI system. You could um, set it up so that you can export your GUI or not export your GUI. The Secure Cell Service 
so SSH is on Linux systems open SSH and it can be controlled using the systemctl command. You can use systemctl with start, stop, restart, status. You can enable or disable if you want to either not start boot time or not start boot time. And so systemctl start and then the service name which is sshd and you can use the dot service if you want. By default, SSH is allowed through the firewall. To make changes, you can use the firewall cmd command and you can either add the service if it's not there, you can remove the service, or if you want to, you can, well additionally, you can make the rules permanent with the dash dash permanent. Note that if you use the dash dash permanent option, it will not change the active firewall settings, it will only change the configuration files so when the firewall is restarted, it will have the new settings in place. You can verify the services are present in the firewall as well using the firewall-cmd command with the dash dash list dash all option to see what's in the firewall. When you connect to unknown servers, SSH prompts you to accept the public key that it is presented with. Keys are remembered and stored in a file called known hosts and remote keys will change very rarely. It's only when the machine is replaced or new keys are generated or if someone's trying to hack you and there's some kind of a man in the middle attack where they're trying to impersonate the server. You can manually add and delete entries. This is useful when you trust the changes but not so good when you don't trust them. SSH has the ability to use keys to authenticate. In order to authenticate using keys, the client machine needs to create a public private key pair set. The public key needs to be installed in the server and the server has a authorized key file in each user's directory that can be used and then you can just log in directly using the authorized key. You can create the key pairs using the SSH key gen command and then you can install them either using the SSH copy ID command or you can manually copy them over and then put them into the authorized keys file. Here are a couple example incantations of things you can type in. You can type in SSH key gen to generate keys. You can tell it what type with the minus T option. You can copy the key over, the public key over to the server using the SSH copy ID command. You can um, manually copy it using SCP. And once you get it copied over there, you need to log into that machine and use the cat command or some other command to get it into the authorized keys file. If you want to, you can also tunnel. Here are a couple of exciting tunneling incantations. The tar command can create, well, archive files. And this command, basically the first command right there, um, you're creating an archive file and the destination of that file is actually the standard out. So that kind of works. And then what we're doing is we are piping this into the SSH command, which is then on the other end using the cat command and redirecting its standard in into a file. So what we're doing is creating a tar archive that is being put into a file on the remote machine. And you can look at the rest of these things. They are kind of uh, weird incantations, but it gives you an idea of some of the things that SSH can do. If you want to troubleshoot SSH, you want to make sure you, that you can connect to the machine. That's usually one of the biggest things. You could either have the address wrong or you could have the host name wrong. You want to make sure the service is running. If it's not running, then that can be a problem. You want to make sure the firewall is open and you can get through it. You want to make sure the remote host is up so you can ping it. You can use nmap to scan it to make sure the SSH port is visible. And you can also be on the server and look at the logs to see if you're having trouble logging in. And this is a brief little overview of SSH. Simple Network Management Protocol, or SNMP. The SNMP protocol is commonly used to gather statistical information from networking devices. It can grab all kinds of information such as bandwidth consumption, um, ports, uh, whether they're on or off, names of machines, all this information can be gathered together and it's usually used to manage an entire network. 
Some variables gathered can also be set using the SNMP protocol tools. SNMP typically operates on UDP ports 161 and 162, 161 for normal communication and 162 for traps or indications when there is a problem. There is a management information base and well, this is for information. SNMP provides a lot of inf information. Each individual element of information can be addressed with a hierarchical dotted decimal number called an object identifier or OID. The object identifier for system name or host name is 1.3.6.1.2.1.1.1 1.5 and this has multiple different pieces in it and the very first one which would be the system name is dot zero so if you have more than one name it might be a dot one and dot two and it kind of increments up to make things easier the MIBs provide names for the numbers you could get the same host name with that number above or you can also use either system.sysname.0 or sysname.0. So those are a little bit simpler, easier to read and recognize and remember as well. Community strings. SNMP does not want to provide information to just anyone, so it requires a password called a community string. There are two default community strings. For read-only information collecting, you can use the default community string public. For read-write information collecting and setting, you can use the default community string private. SNMP uses the UDP protocol and the server ignores messages with the incorrect community string, so you do not know if datagrams were dropped or ignored. It's kind of confusing, makes it difficult. You send it out, you wait 10 seconds, nothing comes back, you say, well, it didn't work. But that could be because your community string is being ignored and there is no reply. Many network devices have active SNMP support the administrators are not aware of. It's very common for printers, for example, to have SNMP support turned on and running. And they might have both the public and the private community strings available. So you might be able to do all kinds of fun things with the printer and the administrator wouldn't even know how you're getting in. Sometimes you have routers or wireless devices or cameras that all have SNMP support turned on and running. So you need to make sure you turn things off that should not have it running. Most SNMP messages are not secure. They send things in plain text, they come back in plain text. If you want to intercept something, you want to see what the community string is, just watch the line, see what it is. So some useful packages. Net SNMP provides the SNMP server. Net SNMP utils provides some utilities for performing queries and making changes. So you can do your SNMP get, SNMP set, your SNMP walk, all kinds of activities and, and utilities right there. When you're trying to configure the server, you need to go and edit the etc snmp snmpd.com file. One of the most common changes people make is change the community string. You'd want to probably make it not be public. So you find the line that says com2sec not config user default public and you can change the string to something else. For example, aloha123 which is also a super secure and secret password that no one will ever guess. The SNMPD service needs to be started in order to start listening. You need to use the systemctl command to start the SNMPD server. So just use systemctl start SNMPD and you can use the dot service if you want. Other options include stop restart, status, enable, and disable. Enable is for making it start at boot time, and disable is to make it so it doesn't start at boot time. In addition to having the service running, you need to make sure you can get through the firewall. 
you can add the service to the firewall with the firewall dash cmd space dash dash add dash service equals snmp and if you want to make it permanent make sure you add the dash dash permanent option to the end of that and it will make it permanent you can verify if the service is in the active firewall using the firewall dash cmd space dash dash list dash all command and that will tell you which services are in the firewall if you have it working you might want to verify it's working so you can use the S and the SNMP client which is provided with client utilities provided by net SNMP utils and I would recommend using the SNMP get and the SNMP walk commands to test your server the following two lines assume your community string is aloha123 and you are just connecting to your local host although you can put the IP address of the server you're connecting to if you have the firewall open when you do the snmp get and the snmp walk commands you want to make sure you pass the snmp version you can use 2c or 1 and you want to make sure you pass the community string with the minus c option there in the top one you are getting the system name or the host name so it's sysname.0 and the SNMP walk, you're going to walk the entire system set of information. So sysname would be one of those items in the system set. And it'll just list a whole bunch of them, walk through it until it runs out of responding OID values. For troubleshooting, you want to make sure your DNS server is set correctly. Sometimes when you're trying to look things up by name, it can be a problem. You want to make sure you can talk to the SNMP server, you can ping it, you can port scan it make sure it's up make sure the firewall is correct you can check your logs you want to make sure the community string is correct if you change it you want to make sure you change your commands you're using to talk to it you want to make sure you have the correct object name and if you're having trouble talking to it try something you know will work so sysname.0 it's a good one to try you also want to make sure the service is running so you can use the net stat minus tune up p command to get a list of what services are there and that is the end of this chapter